So I want to talk today about the disruption of the world's largest industry, the energy industry, $6 trillion a year industry, and how India can be a global energy superpower. You've heard a bit about me. I worked in tech for many years. Microsoft ran a small tech startup. I've written five books. One of them was on this topic of energy, environment, and innovation to overcome the world's resource issues. That led me to working at Singularity, and that also led me to becoming an investor in clean energy. So I invest in early stage clean energy startups, and I'll try to bring some of that perspective of business models and economics to this. Now, energy is a huge business opportunity, but it's also a moral imperative. We need energy for development. If you want to lift people out of poverty, if you want to enable them to innovate, to build new cities, to build new products, they need access to modern energy. 1.3 billion people around the world don't have access to electricity. And at least 300 million of them are here in India, in a country that has one of the world's best tech ecosystems. So that's one moral imperative. But the other moral imperative is dealing with the consequences of energy. Around the world, the World Health Organization says 5 million people a year die of air pollution. 1.2 million Indians die of air pollution a year. It's now the number five killer in India. And India is sadly overtaking China in terms of some of the worst air pollution in the world. So we have this moral imperative to provide more energy and to do so in a way that's clean and safe and healthy for people. Fortunately, we also live in energy abundance. If you took all of the world's energy use for a year and added it up, put it in volumes of oil, imagine a cube of oil, one kilometer on a side, 16 of those. That's what the world uses every year. It's a vast amount. But that is dwarfed by the continual influx of energy from the fusion reactor in the sky. Our sun bombards our planet at the top of the atmosphere with 10,000 times as much energy as we use from all sources combined. There is no shortage of clean energy for us. In fact, if we tried to harness that, 10 seconds of the energy content of the sunlight hitting our planet would meet one day of humanity's energy use. One year of humanity's energy use is met by the energy content of just one hour of sunlight. The issue is not supply. The issue is technology and economics of harnessing it, storing it, and utilizing it effectively. Fortunately, that technology is evolving as well. So I'm going to talk today about what's happening in wind power, what's happening in solar power, even more exciting, what's happening in energy storage, the next big disruption that's coming, what's happening in the future of transportation, and then finally some thoughts on how you, mostly as business people, can take action in this sort of disruptive environment. So let's start with wind power. Wind power used to be a footnote in the world's electricity supply. But that has changed dramatically over the last 20 years or so. We've gone in the last just over a decade from 30 gigawatts of wind power deployed around the world to 300 gigawatts, a 1,000% growth in 11 years. Now, uh, wind power is about 4 or 5% of world electricity, 6% in the US where I'm from. Now, that's happened for a variety of reasons. And one of them, as we all know, is policy decisions, subsidies, for wind power have helped scale, right? But they, those are limited in utility and would not have produced this effect were it not for a second effect, which is an exponential plunge in prices. If we look at the price of wind power contracts signed in the US, wholesale grid electricity costs about six cents per unit in the US, maybe about uh, four rupees per unit. In uh, 1980, the price of wind power wholesale was nearly 10 times that. So it was ridiculous. People will buy the cheapest energy they can buy. It is a fungible resource. You have to make it cheaper if you want to win. But over 20 years, that has changed dramatically. And now the average price of a new wind power deal in the US last year was 2.3 cents, about one and a half rupees per unit, making it the cheapest electricity in large swaths of the country. And the same technology is available here now. So a 24, 25x price decline in that time. And that's happened in large part because we've learned to build these much larger uh, monster machines that are wind turbines. We've made wind turbines taller 
they can access winds up higher where the wind blows more steadily and faster. And if you double the length of a wind turbine blade, it sweeps through four times the area. So you've got a very uh, positive economies of scale. And so you can see that as the size of wind turbines goes up, the price in orange drops. Perhaps more important is that wind power and solar power are intermittent. They only provide power at certain times. But we've, as we've made these larger wind turbines, they're more able to still operate and generate electricity with low speed winds. That has opened up more territory that they can operate in, and it's made them more consistent. This is a measure of the capacity factor of a wind turbine. What fraction of its rated load, of its maximum peak load, does it produce over time? And you see that goes up by about one point per year now. And in the best sites that are highly windy, we have wind turbines producing 50%, 60% of the time. And that's approaching the fraction of rated capacity that a coal plant operates at. The other thing that's really helped in wind power, AI, big data, machine learning algorithms. And so now with the application of that, we're getting better at forecasting what the wind will be even just a few minutes into the future, merging the power output from different wind turbines together and so on. So this is a field that is innovating rapidly and I'd love to talk about it more because the price will keep dropping. But for India, I really wanna move on to the larger changes that are happening with solar power. If you look at just the direct photons that make it to the ground from the sun, with less than half a percent of the world's land area, we could provide all of humanity's energy needs with current efficiency solar modules. Right? So the issue is not abundance, and nor is it amount of land that you need. The issue is and always has been cost. This is a silicon wafer of computer chips, and this is a very expensive object per gram of weight. And Solar panels are made in ways that are not entirely dissimilar. So if you imagined uh, layering thousands of square kilometers with uh, silicon chips, that cost would be enormous, right? But with silicon, we see that there is Moore's Law that has brought down the price per computing unit for decades and decades. In 2011, I wrote an article for Scientific American talking about a similar effect in solar power, an exponential decrease in the cost of solar power. At the time, it was laughed at uh, by experts in the field, even though the data said very clearly it was happening. Uh, but when we look back at what has occurred, the cost of solar has plunged enormously. In the late 1970s, nearly $100 a watt for a module of solar. And now, 36 cents a watt is sort of an average uh, retail price that you can buy. That's a 200 times price reduction over this period of time. And nothing in physical infrastructure drops in price that fast, right? The tractors don't, buildings don't, roads don't. This is almost like the digital revolution. It's not, and this time for digital, the price drop has been millions. But this is still the closest analogy we have that in this physical space, we are having an almost digital-like reduction in price that is still ongoing. And that means that we are now achieving crossover. By crossover, I mean the point at which in the sunny parts of the world, with no subsidies, solar is now the cheapest source of electricity that you can buy. Let me show you what that looks like. If you want to build a new natural gas plant in the US, five or six cents a unit is what it will be. You want to build a new coal plant in India, it'll be about four and a half cents a unit, a kilowatt hour, three rupees, 3.11 rupees was the average tariff for a new coal plant in India last year. So about 4.6 cents, let's say. And now we're seeing those sorts of prices achieved. In Xinjiang and China in the Gobi Desert, a giant solar plant being built at about five cents per kilowatt hour, unsubsidized. In the U.S., I made this slide about two years ago. This is a subsidized price. First Solar, a U.S. company in Macho Springs, Nevada, built this plant at 5.7 cents. Maybe it's a little over 8 cents per kilowatt hour. Still expensive, but it was a very low price at that time. The next year, I had to update the slide because NextEra built one at 4.2 cents. And then the next year, I had to update the slide again because First Solar came in with a new record low in the U.S., selling to Warren Buffett's company, Berkshire Hathaway, at 3.9 cents. And then five months, I had to update this because the city of Palo Alto signed a deal at 3.6 cents buying solar power outside of Los Angeles. Again, that's a subsidized price, 
but it's about 5.1 cents if you back out all the subsidies. So if you look in the US, we've had an 8x reduction in prices over the last decade of the solar contracts being signed. Now that's great. What does it mean for India? Well, in India, a threshold moment occurred just last month when the Rewa Ultra Mega Solar Plant was put out for bids, and the low bid came in at 2.97 rupees per unit, four and a half cents. Importantly, the tariff on, for a new coal plant in India is 3.1 rupees per kilowatt hour. So this unsubsidized is now the first time in India that solar has come in as simply the cheapest electricity you can build. And if we put that in perspective of how fast this change has happened, this is not just the modules, this is the land, the integration, the labor, the frames, all of it. Put that in perspective, three, four years ago, 2013, the price was nine rupees per unit in India. So you've had a 3x price drop in just four years. That is the pace of change that's happening. Now, this is a new record low price. Not all solar this year we built at that price. Most of it would be more expensive. But you can bet that within 12 months, there will be another record low set. And within 12 months after that, there will be another record low set. And almost all the prices of new solar plants in India will be at this level. And India is not even the cheapest place. If you go to Mexico, they had a power auction about six months ago. The average price came in at 5.1 cents, so about, uh, let's say, 3.3 rupees. The low price, 3.5 cents, 2.4 rupees, something like that, from an Italian company, NL. In Chile, in the north, near the equator, we've had a dozen cases now where in power auctions with no subsidies, solar has just swept everything. And the lowest price, when this happened last year in August, 2.91 cents. This was not just the lowest price for solar we'd ever seen. This was the lowest contract price for electricity ever signed on planet Earth with any technology. That record lasted about one month until this happened. This is my favorite picture of all time, I think. In Dubai, uh, this, the second tranche, 750 megawatts of this uh, large solar power plant being built, came in at an astounding 2.4 cents a kilowatt hour. That's 1.6 rupees. That's about half the price of a new coal power plant in India. And this is not a case of just one crazy bidder coming in at a price where they can't make a profit, because the top the four cheapest bids were all under three cents. Now, Dubai benefits from having more sun than India, actually, low labor costs like India, and low borrowing costs. And that's one of the magics, is if you can get your borrowing costs down, then you have the ability to build cheaply. Of course, solar varies in how much sunlight you get. The world's pioneer in building solar until this past two years was Germany. Germany is up there in the green. It actually makes very little uh, physical sense to build solar in, in Germany, but the political will of that country brought down the price for all of us. In the U.S., of course, you see it starting in the south and the west and the southwest. Globally, those 1.3 billion people that don't have electricity live where? They live almost entirely in sunny parts of the world, in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And three quarters of the world's growth in energy demand over the next two decades will be in that rectangle, right? Between India and China and parts of Southeast Asia. China now is the world's number one uh, deployer of and manufacturer of solar panels by a large margin in both. But India is better provisioned with sunlight than China is. In fact, India has the sunlight to make it a solar superpower. So I told you that wind power went up by a factor of 10 in 11 years. Solar power makes that look slow. Starting from a lower base, still the pace of deployment has been enormous. A 100x growth in 13 years around the world. In India, over the last seven years, so half that period of time, the growth in the amount of solar deployed has been 75x, a staggering pace to 12.2 gigawatts as of March, as of just last month. And now the prime minister wants to hit 100 gigawatts in India, and that might sound crazy, but it is entirely doable 
at this growth rate. So you heard that uh, if you take an exponential process, it looks like a hockey stick. If you put it on a log scale, it looks like a straight line. This is the growth of solar around the world on a log scale. Basically 40% growth per year, doubling every two years. Now this will slow. This cannot be maintained indefinitely. The pace will slow. Last year was only 35%. Maybe that will be the new growth rate. But it's still a phenomenal growth rate that amounts to uh, you know, 100 gigawatts a year globally being installed in the next two or three years. And this intersects something else. It intersects the learning curve, the way that manufactured goods get cheaper with scale. It's the Ford Model T. And with the Model T, it's the first time we see this phenomenon that you can take the price of the Model T and the vertical axis and the number of Model Ts built, and it's a very smooth line. As you double production, you brought down the price of a Model T 16% every time. And if you look at solar in the same way, as production goes up on the horizontal axis, cost goes down. That's the real predictor. And that leads you to this phenomenon that is true of nearly all exponential technologies, which is this virtuous cycle, this positive feedback loop, which is you have some innovation that brings down your price. That opens up a new market to you. First, solar cells were only cheap enough to go on power or satellites in space. But that allowed them to sell some units. That scaled the industry. That brings prices down. And that, in turn, leads to uh, the continuation of this, because now you tap into more new markets, which brings down your prices again and again and again. How cheap can solar get? Last year, in 2015, actually, I made this forecast in the sunny parts of the world we could get down to 2.5 cents per kilowatt hour uh, by maybe the 20 years from now. I was so wrong, because those red stars are how the recent record low prices that we've had. I am one of the world's most optimistic people on solar, and I have been wrong on how, far, how quickly the price is coming down. So the cost will keep dropping. We still have to deal, of course, with what happens if the sun is not shining or the wind is not blowing. And a common view is that solar will mean that we don't need a grid. But that is not true. The opposite is true. Solar and wind make the grid actually more important because you can do things like this. On a good day in Southern California, the sun shines during the day. Wind can blow at any hour, but it blows statistically more at night than it does during the day. So solar plus wind add up. Same thing happens over the course of a year. This is in Germany, 12 months of data. In the summer months, there's more sun. And in the winter months, there's more wind and add them up, and you have more and more of your power needs met. So for a subcontinent like India, probably 70% from just solar and wind put together. But ultimately, you have to do other things. Anybody know this company, Nest? What happened to Nest? Google bought them. What did Google pay for Nest? $3 billion. Why do you pay $3 billion for a thermostat? Because it's the start of the smart grid. What Nest does is it allows you to programmatically control when energy consumption happens. It lets utilities move the energy demand from when energy is scarce or demand is high to when energy is more abundant and it's cheaper. That's adding intelligence to the grid. That's one form of it. Or electric vehicle charging. We're going to see EVs grow and grow. It makes sense to charge them when the energy is abundant and the prices are lower. In northern Europe, with a lot of wind power, middle of the night. In India, eventually that will be middle of the day when they're sitting at work. Or things like water, freshwater issues around the world. India perhaps needs desalination as well as better treatment of already used water. Here's an example of a, a real life desalination plant. This plant in uh, Abu Dhabi processes 500 million gallons, like 1,500 million uh, liters of salt water into fresh every day and it uses eight gigawatts of power. And even though the, price, the energy cost of desalination has plunged, it still uses a huge amount of energy, and that's half of its costs. So can you take your manufacturing process, your desalination process, and tie it to the places and times when energy is cheapest? Ultimately, though, we have to crack this problem of storage. And storage, to me, is where solar was 10 or 15 years ago. Still expensive, but on the verge of an uh, incredible price drop that we will look back and say, that was a black swan. No one expected that. Well, I'm telling you now to expect it. 
So Elon here is introducing the Tesla Powerwall, and the funny thing is, this is not a Tesla product, not really. It's a Tesla product, but inside of it is Panasonic batteries. And what Elon's doing here is he's using Tesla's brand power to get this technology out to people, but there's not been some sudden new technological breakthrough. Instead, there's been decades of a slow exponential trend that people weren't watching. If you look at the energy density of a battery, how much energy can you store per gram, and the cost of energy, they're both exponential curves. Over a 15-year period, the density has gone up by about a factor of three, the energy capacity of a battery, and the cost has gone down by a factor of 10. And that's actually a very predictable long-term process. So a lot of forecasters have looked not using this sort of exponential model and said, oh, we think uh, battery prices can come down by 3x over 10 years, starting in 2013. Tesla's target is 5x in five years, and they look like they're on path to doing that. So if you look at this, it starts to say that uh, you can have a small home with a solar panel and a small battery half the size of Tesla Powerwall, and in the summer months in Germany, this would supply 70% of its own electricity for a house with a refrigerator and appliances and so on. And in India, that would be higher and more consistent throughout the year. People are not going to go off the grid. We all want 99.9% .9 uptime. Flip on the lights and it comes on. But if you're a utility selling by the unit and your customers are cutting their demand by 70 or 80%, what does that do to your business model? Right? That's a disruption. We call it the utility death spiral in the US, and it's a real danger that exists. Now, utilities, of course, are aware of this, and so Tesla took $1 billion in pre-orders for the Tesla Powerwall in the first week that it was on sale, but 90% of them were not for homes. 90% of them were these utility-scale batteries. This is something that utilities can do as well. And every other manufacturer is in this. Trina Solar has a shipping container-sized megawatt-hour battery I've stepped inside of, and these are still enormously expensive. The price per unit round trip is maybe 20 cents, maybe 12 or 13 rupees per kilowatt hour. It's actually incredibly expensive. But that's cheaper than peak power. We have these things called peaker natural gas plants that might get operated for just 10 hours a month. And their cost is enormous. Their cost is maybe 25 cents a kilowatt hour. And there's gigawatts of these deployed around the world. And the math says they are now out of business because batteries have come under that price. And again, as the batteries hit those larger markets, their prices come down, all right? How fast? Battery prices drop at the same rate as solar. The top line here, the green diamonds, that is the exponential price decline of solar panels. The blue diamonds are the exponential price decline of batteries. They map to almost exactly the same pace, between 21 and 24% price reduction per doubling of scale. So batteries now have hit a price where some markets make sense for them. That will allow them to scale, which will bring down the cost, increase demand, and so on. And it's not just lithium ion. Lithium ion is the battery technology that is in the lead now, but behind that are dozens of other battery technologies. So I'm an investor in one. This is a flow battery company. And this is a big, bulky battery. You wouldn't want to use it in your phone. It's three times as large. But where a lithium-ion battery might uh, be depleted or damaged by 1,000 charge discharge cycles, this can go 10,000 charge discharge cycles. So there's huge amounts of innovation still in the pipeline. And ultimately, energy storage can drop in price by another 5 to 10x over the next few decades. So this leads to some crazy conclusions, because we've always assumed that clean energy would be more expensive energy. We should do it because we have to save the planet. We should do it because we want clean air. But the price of energy always fluctuates. What does the price of technology do? It only goes down. And so if you play this math out, it tells you that clean energy will be the cheapest energy, and that is a game changer. Even very conservative organizations are now starting to say this. So the International Energy Agency, the world's experts on energy, the IEA is not what you would call an exponential organization. All right, let me show you. Here are the IEA's forecasts of how fast solar would grow over the last uh, 15 years or so. The 2002 forecast is the lowest line on this graph, and the dark blue is how fast it's actually grown. And so what you see is that every year at the IEA, they up their forecast, and every year they have to up it. Oh, 2004, we were a little low. 
lift it. 2006, we're a little low, lift it again. 2008, lift it again. 2009, lift it again. It looks like someone is taking the same Excel macro and hitting Control C, Control V into the next row. Now, who thinks that they, that 2014 forecast looks pretty good, right? Who thinks the IEA has got it now? Who thinks they figured it out? No one? You have no confidence in the International Energy Agency, the world's experts in energy? You know who the butt of my joke is. And they haven't, because they just draw a straight line. They assume that solar deployment each year will be the same as before and not going up. When what we actually see is 35% growth per year in deployments. We see an exponential process, not a linear process. And yet the IEA says solar will be the cheapest and largest source of energy by mid-century around the planet. Well, here's UBS, a large bank, saying something I thought I'd only ever hear myself say, renewables are now deflationary to energy prices. Or here's Alliance Bernstein, a private equity firm in the U.S. They put together this graph called Welcome to the Terror Dome, based on a, a song by the rap group Public Enemy, and they drew the costs of coal, oil, and natural gas along the bottom here. And then that gray line, I think someone's kid took a crayon and scrawled on this chart or something like that, right? Now, that's the cost of solar, right? When you zoom out 60 years, and if we added the cost of wind to this chart and added the cost of batteries that are starting their exponential decline, that's what this looks like. That is disruption in the making, right? That is the new digital technology that looks far inferior to analog film, but will lead Kodak to be out of business. And in fact, that market disruption, that business disruption is happening. This is Peabody Coal. Anyone heard of them? Largest private coal company in the world four years ago. Largest coal company of any sort in the US. Now in bankruptcy. This is their stock price. BTU, that was their stock ticker symbol. We're all about energy, right? In fact, the four largest coal companies in the US all went bankrupt in a four-year period. 99% of their market cap disappeared. Not because coal is gone, but because coal demand peaked. And if it starts to go down even a little bit, if you're selling a commodity into a market that is shrinking, that is not a good place to be. And so we're seeing that possibly happen elsewhere as well. If you look at the utilization of existing uh, coal thermal power plants, in India, it's the top line here, the red line, it's gone from 80%, which is healthy, down to a little over 60%. Those other lines are the EU, China, and the US, where all of them are hitting 50% utilization. And if your coal plant is only being run 50% of the time, you're starting to lose money. And if you're losing money, you have to raise the rates, and that accelerates the pace at which you get disrupted. So that's electricity becoming cheap and abundant. But of course, that's not the only sort of energy we use, because we have to travel from place to place, right? And the king of this is oil. Yet I believe oil will be disrupted as well. And so did uh, this man, Sheikh Yamani, who was the Saudi oil minister during the uh, oil crisis of the 70s. But the Stone Age did not end for a lack of stone. It ended because we invented bronze tools. And bronze was just a better technology than stone. So we left all these stones on the ground that we could have used because we had something better. And he's saying we're going to leave oil in the ground too because we have better technologies that we'll invent. All right? Oil is an incredibly volatile market. It's hard to predict. The oil price swings of the last 10 years have often been caused by a 1% or 2% supply-demand imbalance. Right? You raise supply by 1% or 2%, the price craters. Demand goes up 2% higher than supply, the price or soars. Right? And so no one can predict the short-term price of oil. This is the real short-term price of oil in dark blue versus various analyst projections of what it would be. All, everyone assumes it'll sort of return to normalcy. It's not really what happens. I can't predict the short-term price of oil. But I can maybe predict the long-term price of oil, and I think the long-term price of oil will be cheap because it will be, like coal, a market that is shrinking rather than go, growing. And then the price will be just marginally above the cost of production. And the reason for that, which I did not believe two or three years ago, is electrification. I thought electric cars were not going to go anywhere. And it's still radical to say that they will be a big contributor to the destruction of oil demand, because they are only 0.1% of cars on the road. They are less than one pixel on a graph. They're smaller than the width of a line. But their growth rate is astounding. 
73% growth in electric vehicles last year. And now they're 1% of all the new cars being sold. In two years, there'll be 2 or 3% of the new cars being sold. And as you've heard, they, these things are amazing. A Tesla, Salim said, is a computer on wheels. It looks like a spaceship that you're in. And it's a computer on wheels in other ways. With a Tesla, you get new feature updates. When Tesla released their first model, if you had it on, you had your foot on the brake, took your foot off, it stayed put. But a gas car creeps forward a little bit, right? Some Tesla owners complained. So one day, 10,000 Tesla owners get an email saying you have a new feature in your car. If you go to your control panel, uh, turn on this thing called creep. When you take your foot off the brake, the car will roll forward. There was no recall. They didn't bring the car back into the shop. They released a new feature, a new app, if you will, for their car over the wire. All right? Now, that's an interesting one. But then some, for whatever reason, the Tesla was already the fastest street legal car, but Elon decided that it wasn't fast enough. So one day, Tesla owners woke up to an email that said, you have a new feature in your car. It's called insane mode. And if you turn it on, you can drive really, really fast. You can accelerate really, really fast. Now, we used to think of electric cars as boring, no fun, short range, clunky, underpowered, right? Let me show you what insane mode looks like, and I apologize for the little bit of profanity you will hear. I'm, I'm really mad that the option is insane. Like, it's not like just... Boy, that's that, perfect. That's, Isn't that good? That's a random, like... Because the future the car is insane, right? <laughs> Everyone thinks the car is insane, so why not have... You know, like an insane mode, right? That makes sense. So you just come to like a complete stop. All right. And then before you know it, you just jam. Oh shit, Brooks! <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> 70 miles an hour. Brooks, oh <laughs> shit. Yo, first of all, you can't fucking do that to people. <laughs> like, you gotta give people fair warning. <laughs> Why? Like, you can't fucking just say, there you can. Brooks, what? I think I shit it in your seat. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a risk of having a Model S. Electric cars were clunky. They weren't going to be any fun to drive, but it's an exponential technology. Batteries got cheaper, battery density went up. Now, that's an $80,000 US car. It's a ridiculous car, right? It's not affordable. But now we have a $35,000 car coming out that accelerates faster than a Ferrari, has self-driving features, can take five people, and is basically free to fill up. All right? And it's not just Tesla. We have multiple providers that are looking at cars in the $20,000 range with 300-kilometer ranges. You saw a version of this graph the other day. The U.S. Department of Energy forecasted the number of electric vehicles would have a 200-mile range. And it's not the blue line, it's the red line at the very bottom. If you can't read it, I forgive you, because it's so low. They said there'd be 20, 30,000 cars in the 200-mile range, electric, on the roads by 2040. Tesla sold 300,000 Model 3s in the first week. One vendor, one manufacturer is on pace to sell orders of magnitude more cars than the DOE thought there would be of all sorts and do it in the next two or three years. And as those, they sell more cars, the battery is the most expensive part, the battery price drops. As the price drops, they sell more cars, and that means the cost drops again and again, and so you're back into that virtuous cycle. And the craziest thing I will say is that electric cars are destined to be cheaper than internal combustion engine cars, and that's because this is the entire drivetrain of an electric vehicle has 90% fewer moving parts than an internal combustion vehicle. And that means when they're made at even similar scale, they will be dramatically cheaper. Within the next 10, 15 years, that Porsche acceleration five-seater self-driving car will be cheaper than a smart car. And when that happens, you are talking about the destruction of two million barrels a day of oil demand. And that's about what it takes to plunge the oil price down to just over the marginal price of production. So that's why I will say I can't predict the short-term price of oil, but I believe the long-term price of oil will be cheap because we'll be using less. There's more technologies on the way, better batteries that could increase the range by about a factor of 10. As we move into Uberization, when was the last time you had an Uber and worried about how much range was left in the car? You don't. That will further accelerate the pace at which we deploy these. As we move into self-driving, that will accelerate the pace as well, because the cars will just go charge themselves. OK, so in this disruptive world, how do you take action? The Chinese aphorism, probably somewhat apocryphal, that crisis is danger plus opportunity. Right? You've heard about the danger between air pollution 
climate change, we have very real risks. We have a moral imperative to provide more energy and do so in a clean way, and that is an opportunity. And there's also huge business opportunities. In the energy business, if we look at the increased demand for electricity from electric vehicles, if all light passenger cars in India were electric instead of oil, within about 10 years, that could be a $50 billion market opportunity. We look at、uh, how different companies have soared in this space. Rooftop solar in the US, how did it get its start? It was a combination of things. The technology got better, the price plunged. There were policy choices made to make it more affordable. Things like net metering just passed in India. But ultimately, it was a business model innovation that set it free. Solar City doesn't make solar panels. They're not a technology company. They're a company that said, people want solar on their roof, and it has a, maybe a five or seven year payback, but nobody has the money to buy it. We will just provide it to you for free, and you'll pay us monthly. We'll lease it to you, and we'll arbitrage. We'll split the difference in the savings. We'll skim some of the profit off of it. So, as an investor, I look for companies like that that provide a solving an efficiency, as Nick said, provide an immediate value to a consumer, and then skim profit off of it in the back end. That's one of the things that I look for. And when you find those intersections of a technology advancement, Policy change and a new business model opportunity, that's where the rapid change can happen. And they often exist in a virtuous cycle with each other. And what's waiting, what's needed, is for someone to take leadership in starting that wheel spinning. And when they do, that can be a multi billion dollar opportunity like Elon has seized. So that's why I'm an optimist, and that's why I believe India can be an energy superpower. Thank you very much. <laughs>